I do just realize that I said shoots him down into the nutsack, and I am aware that babies <laughs> do not grow inside the nutsack. That would be very painful. Yo, what is going down? Welcome to Owls at Dawn. We are just two dudes from Southern California who studied philosophy, politics, and religion around the world and decided to start a podcast where we could bullshit with impunity. I am Austin Hayden Smith. And I am Troy Polidori. And I forgot to turn my fan off during that intro, so apologies if there was a humming in the background, but fuck it. It is warm here. It's starting to get summertime, so I gotta figure out how to stay cool any way that I can. Yeah, sure it was a fan, dude. We all know what's going on in your background. It was my vibrator that I forgot to turn off. It was just buzzing on my wood floors. <laughs> I've named him Ricardo. Ricardo, be quiet. Stop betraying me. Ricardo after who? People will think. Ricky? Yeah, Ricky Ricardo, man. Come on. Who didn't want to bang him? Everyone wanted to bang Ricky Ricardo. Was he a, was he a sex icon back in the day? I think as much as they had sex icons, I think so. Like an unsaid one because he's Cuban, so you can't really advertise that if you're like a white woman. But that's the whole point, right? Is that's why he was that like, it's like they sublimated their exotic desires for the the brown skinned or the Latino other, right? Yeah, it had to be a, a sublimated sex object. Yeah, for sure. There should be, a, there should be like a documentary on that. Yeah, but it was just wholesome, right? That's how it would, that's like, you can tell that your grandma was getting all wet when she's like, oh, that Ricky Ricardo, he's such a <laughs> nice looking man. You're like, yeah, I know what you're thinking, grandma. I don't think I ever want to hear you say grandma and wet in the same proximity ever again. My God. I imagine someone's listening uh, to this apologize. episode for the first time, or listening to us for the first time on this episode. They have now turned off and reported us to the stop or whatever. Yes, the decency, uh, the humankind decency police. Well, sweet. So this is part two of us going through Derek Parfit's reasons and persons. We kind of teased what we were going to talk about last week. So if you are just turning in for the first or tuning in for the first time, or if you just whatever skip around and uh, the title caught your attention and you didn't check out last week's, I definitely recommend checking it out. Although it's not required, but I would I would recommend checking out the previous episode. But I think this one will because we'll give a little recap, and I think it'll kind of stand on its own once we get into it. But we'll be talking about his um, his calculus that he calls the repugnant conclusion, um, which how would you give a, a brief little teaser so that people will be inclined to stick around, Troy? Yeah, so the basic idea behind the repugnant conclusion, which is kind of a wonderful... Parfit didn't mince words when uh, naming things, right? <laughs> um, mm. It seems like there's not an obvious way to uh, make the case that it would be bad to have a gigantic population of people in the world who are all basically uh, miserable, even though it seems obvious that would be bad. So why is it bad? That's probably not the greatest tagline. <laughs> but if you're philosophically <laughs> inclined, then the idea of not having a good reason for something obvious is something that you're interested in. So maybe that'll um, pick you up. Awesome. Sweet. So that's what we'll be getting into. But before that, just give a quick reminder that if you find value in what we're producing, if you want access to our bonus content, please go to patreon.com slash owls at dawn and throw us some pennies if you can. And if you can't, then just send us emails, tweets, love, share our content, tell your friends, tell your grandmas, and uh, <laughs> let's get everybody wet. Tell them there's some, some good Ricky Ricardo content on this podcast. That's right. That's right. It's metaphorical, sublimate, sublimated, libidinal sexiness. Grandma learn how to download stat. <laughs> All right. So let's get into the show. First thing we got to do is we got to start off the episode the way that we start off every motherfucking episode. It's with the shitty minute. This is where one of us gets to rant and rave about something that's pissing us off. Troy, it is your turn. Swing away, my friend. Yeah, so did you hear at all about this uh, little bit of a brouhaha over um, Buttigieg's college affordability plan? Um, I haven't actively muted him, but I have basically <laughs> muted, him. muted him. Yeah, like I haven't like actually gone in and entered that as a muted word, but when I see it, my eyes glaze over. So, no. It's actually a great idea to do that um, because... 
I can't, there's so many times when I want to look at my phone just to kind of get a break from doing work or something. <laughs> and then someone's yelling about Buttigieg and I'm just like, oh my God, I just don't care. I know, man. Uh, this election cycle might break me. This oh, is the one. Yeah, there's going to have to be some, some <laughs> strong like vacations in the middle of uh, the fall <laughs> and summer, probably. Oh, gosh. Okay, so explain to me the brouhaha. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of uh, obvious right now that there's a split in the Democratic primary between uh, moderates and, I don't know if you call it like progressives or lefties or whatever you want to refer to it as. Um, and it's probably much bigger than just this split ideologically, but the way it's cast is Sanders and Warren on one side and then the moderates on the other, like Biden and Buttigieg and, and whomever else. And one of the ways uh, that gets cast is through the idea of what we should do about college affordability, um, given that student mm. loans are at a crisis level right now um, for millennials. So, you know, uh, Sanders especially is, is touting the uh, free tuition for public colleges plan. And moderates are countering that with, uh, you know, free college for people who have families who make less than 100K or uh, something like that. Um, and I think that's basically mm -hmm. what Buttigieg's college affordability plan is, um, you know, enlarging uh, Pell Grants um, and then a free public college for, you know, people who are middle class and, and below. And uh, obviously this is all just um, campaign speak and none of it will actually happen especially for the moderates, they're just lying to you. But let's just kind of take it on on, on good faith for a second. Um, there was a, a quote from Buttigieg responding to the criticism that um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez leveled against him concerning the sort of um, idea of whether or not we should have universal programs, especially regarding like public college and stuff like that. Um, and this is a thing we've talked about a lot in podcasts is the, the virtue of universal programs. Um, versus means-tested mm -hmm. ones. And um, mm -hmm. just for, for people who don't understand, uh, means-tested basically just a means-tested program just means something is going to um, only benefit a certain part of the population, usually based on their income level. And so you kind of have to prove that you have that income level or have, have your means tested to then get that benefit. Um, so it's not universal. It doesn't just go to everyone, right? So a universal program would be something like public schools, K through 12, libraries, firefighters, police with a caveat there that maybe it's formally universal but substantively not um and so Buttigieg responded to this um criticism from AOC by saying a number of things but one being the idea that's kind of cast a lot um, by people when this idea of universal free college a uh, public college comes out comes about and it's that not everyone goes to college and we shouldn't ignore the fact that not everyone goes to college and then there's some sort of elitism um, to assuming that everyone goes to college and therefore it should be universal in the same way that like everyone's in danger of, you know, being like murdered so that we should have universal police or everyone's in danger of having their house burned down. So we should have universal firefighters or everyone's in danger of being sick. So we should have universal healthcare. Oh wait, no, they don't include that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what was that great line from always sunny in Philadelphia? Like you don't pay for a hospital. You don't pay for, you know, uh, a cop to shoot a guy. Um, <laughs> which is a great line from, uh, uh, what's his name? I'm always sunny. Charlie. YouTube it. Love Charlie. But, um, I wanted to just kind of rant for a second about this whole idea that it's a, it's elitism to think that, uh, college should be universal because not everyone goes to college, that it only will benefit sort of people who are already well off, right? Um, the people whose parents already went to college, so they're likely to go to college and stuff like that. And I think that. This is really, really wrongheaded. Um, for all the reasons that we always talk about universal programs being a virtue, first of all, being that when a program is universal and benefits everybody, it tends to last, right? It tends to be popular and it tends to last. When everyone has to rely upon a program, um, it doesn't end up getting uh, placed on the chopping block for the most part, um, politically speaking. So you think of programs like uh, food stamps and CHIP, which goes to kids, and... Um, many others that are means-tested programs, those end up being on the chopping block whenever a Republican gets into um, you know, the White House or has control of Congress, and even Democrats do it, right? Clinton um, um, famously uh, kind of cut welfare. Obama really, really wanted to do his grand bargain where he would cut 
Social Security and Medicare benefits, but he never got to do it, thank God. Um, but all these, even though Social Security, of all things, is you know universal, although it, it doesn't benefit you until you uh, retire. And so universal programs are good for that reason, just for the sake that they actually tend to last because they have a broad base of people who rely upon it and who benefit from it. But even beyond that, this idea that college is a luxury and that we shouldn't um, initiate universal programs, which end up substantively only benefiting people who are already going to be well off because they have a college degree um, and therefore will make more money than someone who doesn't have a college degree. It's really important, I think, to talk about the fact that college is not this some sort of luxury good that only benefits already well off people. It might, in some cases, end up being that way, but it's not necessarily that way, right? We should really care about this idea that college can be affordable and in fact free and available to anybody who wants to go right mm. that's really important it's important to say that um anybody who wants to go to college can do so and not cripple themselves with um tens of thousands of dollars of student debt but then also i don't think there's anything wrong or elitist with encouraging people to go to college obviously k-12 through is viewed as a necessary um a necessary accomplishment for anybody who wants to get um, any sort of, you know, well-paying job. You don't have to do it. You don't have to finish high school. You're not put in jail if you don't do it. But it certainly is, I think, it's assumed that you should do this if you want to be a functioning member of society. Um, and we shouldn't hold people, um, like, morally responsible if they don't finish it. But we can still encourage them to do so, right? And I think college, at this point, should be something pretty similar. Um, mm -hmm. It's really good to go to college. You don't have to be someone who's dedicated to being academic for the rest of your life to benefit from going to college. And you can encourage people to spend four years um, of their life dedicated towards learning um, without sort of holding them morally responsible if they choose a different path. And I don't think anybody really does that. Uh, I don't think there's a, a strong moral stigma against people who don't go to college. Maybe in some circles like really elitist circles that's the case, but amongst regular people, I don't really find that to be the case. Um, so I don't think we're in danger of having like um, this stigma on people from not going to college uh, if it's free. Um, and then above that, you know, there's this, there's this theory that the purpose of college mostly is, is to signal the fact that you can accomplish uh, a large task and finish it. It's called like the signaling theory of education or whatever, that beyond whatever you actually learn in college, the most important point is you can show employers that you actually did a, or completed a large task and they can sort of trust you to uh, follow through on things when they're difficult and, and finish them and whatnot. And, you know, I, I really hate that as an idea of like a theory of education. But um, there's something to say about the fact that uh, you can sort of signal that you've completed this large task, right? And that can be a large part of the value of an education in America. And also say it doesn't have to be that way, right? Even if this was true, that the main value of a college education is to signal to employers that you can accomplish a large task. It doesn't have to be that way. We can change the system so that college is actually about enriching your life, right? Yeah. I always ask students, um, what, what do you do when you're not working? When you're not doing something that you have to do to survive, Right, and to make it in life, what do you do with your time? And then inevitably, they're going to say something or list things along the lines of things they could actually study and learn about in college, right? Mm -hmm. When it comes to playing video games or reading books or watching movies or um, engaging in some craft or creating something or uh, joining some group or whatever, all the content that they're dealing with, the stuff they can actually learn about in college in various ways. So I don't think it's the case that college is this elitist program which only benefits people who are already going to be well off. I think college can benefit literally anybody who wants to go, anybody who can put together a sentence. And I think that everybody, uh, everybody who has a functioning cognitive system is able to benefit from college and uh, should go if they should be able to go if they want to. And there's nothing necessarily elitist about that. What do you think? Yeah, it's, my mind is racing uh, with, through like a bunch of different themes here. Um, one of them is that it just seems that the the advocacy for universal university versus a means tested, let's say, maintenance of 
you know, for profit or um, or privatized. Well, I guess there would still be private universities or some type of um, what's the word I'm looking for? Profit driven, motivated university system. Let's say um, that the like the distinction between those two, I think, issue from radically different views of the world and what type of world we can build. And I think that they're entirely incongruous, actually. And even though I don't think that implementing universal education would somehow be the catalyst to change the world, whatever the fuck that term means, um, it absolutely is aiming towards a vision of education that doesn't fit easily because again i do think they are essentially incongruous it doesn't fit easily or nicely within let's say the neoliberal views of education that would include the idea that oh you go to college so that you can prove to an employer again this instrumental rationality that proves to the employer that you can be a good worker again that you can be a nice cog in the fucking wheel right but universal education something that is valued as a public good views education in a completely contrary sense and i think that the the moderates let's say within the dem party they whether or not they consciously know it or they just habitually or instinctively they know that they know that universal education would essentially contest the ideological prism within which they find themselves and that's why the best they can ever do is be like yeah we'll just increase some pell grants and access to loans for people who don't qualify for the funding and maybe free college for people under a certain threshold or whatever, you know, the criteria is that they settle on. Even if they do that, they have to hold on to something that is still a part of this perpetual process of, I know we throw this word around a lot, but let's just use it for the simplicity's sake as a placeholder now, but for the neoliberalization of the socioeconomic system in which we live, right? So I think universal education is radically profound because it precisely is issuing from a different vision of the world. And that's why, even though it might not immediately seem to be as universal as like universal healthcare, for example, it nevertheless still issues from a vision of the world that is contrary to the one that perpetuates socioeconomic alienation through the perpetually expanding processes of neoliberalization so that's why i think that it's so extremely important you know yeah i think you're absolutely right that um and not even subconsciously necessarily it's it's pretty consciously the case that uh free college free public college would uh, among other things make it so that people when they get out of college are not are able to sort of choose the jobs and careers they want without thinking about money as being the all important factor because they have all this student debt they have to pay back which starts up in six months you know yeah uh, and that gives a lot of power to uh potential employees um over you know choosing between different employers and deciding what they want to do um, for a career mm -hmm. and that's a huge factor right i mean it's absolutely the case that a lot of these um, big corporations want to have um, the ability to threaten, basically, you know, um, implicitly threaten the employee that if you don't basically do what we say, then you're not going to be able to pay your student loans when they um, come due. And that's basically the way that debt functions in society. And so any way in which we can stop that from happening gives power to employees at the front end, regardless of, you know, whether we actually have changed into, you know, um, like a socialist system or something. Um, even in capitalism, this is the yes. case. Yeah, I mean, now, ceteris paribus, I think there are some problems if you just get free public college that need to be addressed. I think that it can't just simply be like the tentpole program. It has to be one amongst others. It, it, it can't be like that people, you know, high five each other and be like, you know, victory is ours because it could lead to in the long term um, a deepening of class relations where you have the private sector, private institutions that um, kind of just expand somehow and they funnel and they widen and they enlarge in, or they, yeah, they enlarge in 
and then you have the public school system that ends up being for the plebs, right? So I do foresee potential problems with it as well that need to be addressed, you know, that there need to be other ways of kind of like hedging or mitigating the position um, that is attached to the desire for free public education, you know? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, you, even if that was you had free public colleges, it wouldn't technically be this universal program in the same way that like police and firefighters are, right? Because um, you still have this private uh, offshoot that the elite would go to. Um, but I guess that technically does exist for firefighters too, right? You hear all about in California these um, these wildfires that threaten places in Beverly Hills and they have their own private firefighting companies uh, that are out there quickly to, to help them out. So that kind of stuff exists everywhere. Um, and you're right that, yeah. you know, free public college is not going to resolve the contradictions of capitalism right? or create like, uh, or like, really erase um, wealth inequality and social inequality. Um, but it is at least one step I think, towards that. Yeah, I, I think people think that somehow it might equip the revolutionary agent, right? Like if you have free college, that somehow the proletariat is now going to be educated and armed and everyone's going to be reading Franz Fanon. And then because <laughs> then everybody's going to be able to go to, I don't know, fucking Berkeley or wherever they're going to be able to go. Uh, and everyone's going to be, no, it's still going to be competitive, you're still going to have issues of like trying to deal with like the sign value of the university. So some of these like free public universities are going to have to deal with how they let people in or not let people in. That's going to be an issue that they deal with. And then I think you're even going to have like, I think you're going to have a minor exodus of let's say middle upper class types whose parents or maybe even for themselves will view these institutions now as not being as illustrious because um, you kind of take away scarcity a little bit, or at least you take away, what's the word I'm looking for? You take a little bit away of like the consumerist incentive, which creates a certain desire, right? And a certain type of sign value on these institutions. And so they'll like flee towards other pastures, which will then affect maybe the private institutions. And maybe they'll start to expand their numbers or something like that. I don't know. I'm completely speculating here, but I could see stuff like that happening. Yeah. It's an empirical question whether that would be the case. I kind of doubt it, given that you know, if this was a, a universal system that was being built from the ground up, then I think maybe you'd see a lot of that. Um, but I, given that most of these public colleges already have their reputations intact and they have a certain sign value to people um, already, I kind of think it'll say the same, which means there already is you know, inequality there, right? Um, a degree from Harvard you know, sets you for life in a way that you know, even a degree from a really good four-year public institution won't do. Um, but there will still be, you know, quite a lot of prestige to going to UCLA, right? Uh, and I don't think that would um, diminish because it was free. Uh, there would still, of course, be, you'd have to actually, there'd be like a meritocratic line there where you'd, you know, have to sort of uh, accomplish certain things to get in, right? Um, but I, I don't worry so much about this whole, like, there's going to be a brain drain or like a wealth drain um, from public colleges because they're free. That could be, I could be wrong about that, but I think if it happens, it would be minimal. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. That's I'm an just, empirical question. So it's interesting to think about. Yeah, I'm just spitballing here. Yeah, maybe. But yeah, it's interesting. It's so strange that Buttigieg has been the guy that he like, he was hot for a minute, then he disappeared for a bit and now he's hot again. It's so like, how fucking fickle is this election cycle? Is this what it's always like? If, if, am I, or is this just more fickle because of Twitter and the sensationalist news media? It's just I mean, this, so fucking fickle right now. Yeah, I mean, I'm just spitballing about this, but I think it's just that the, um, the mainstream media's ties to corporate donors for different politicians. We've always known that this is what drives the primary process, right, and the nomination process. Um, yeah. but it, it always, it kind of seemed a little bit more organic in the past maybe. And now it's just obvious <laughs> that every time Kamala Harris drops out, yeah. now the, now everyone's moving towards their money towards Buttigieg because he's the only one who, um, is a moderate who doesn't seem like their brains falling out of their ears. And so, uh, yeah, it just, it's so obvious that they're sort of moving all their chips to different people to make sure that, that especially Sanders, but also a little bit with Warren is not the nominee. I mean, you, you saw that thing floated about Obama the other week, right? That if Sanders gets the nomination, he'll personally step in and stop it from happening. Oh, hope and change. 
hope and change. <laughs> yeah, which you know was was a, a thinly veiled threat out there. Oh my gosh, man. It is crazy. Yeah, it is insane that the election cycle it lasts for as long as it does. Like, it is oh, insane. God. It's literally... It, it's... It's... It's unhealthy. It is actually unhealthy. I think it makes us unhealthy. Maybe it's a... Maybe it's a good thing for the elites because they just beat us into submission because then everyone becomes apolitical. And that's why you get, like, 50% voter turnout. You know, in Australia, they haven't had lower than something like 90-something percent. I mean, they have mandatory. You get, like, a $20 fine or some shit like that if you don't vote. But it's, like, 93% voter turnout. <laughs> like, that's nuts. I don't even know what that would be like. Right? That's insane, man. Just everybody fucking votes. And it's not a huge, like, $20 fine. You know, people aren't going to freak out about that shit. Maybe it's a little more. People correct me if I'm wrong. I had a friend tell me that the other day, but then he got into a debate with somebody else the other who was also Australian, so they didn't even know, and they were both Australian. But it, whatever it is, it's it's less than 100 bucks. It's less than 50 bucks if you get fined, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So, I don't know, man. That's it, man. It's a good way to keep us apolitical and apathetic and just looking. As Wolfgang Streck says, uh, coping hoping, doping, and shopping. That's how we <laughs> deal with capitalism. All right, so should we move on to this uh, repugnant conclusion? Let's do it. Lead us into the deep, deeper waters, brother. So to recap, last week we talked about um, what's called the non-identity problem. Um, so let's just kind of recap the background of that and then see how that leads okay. us into the repugnant conclusion. We'll talk about that for yes. this main segment. So Parfit began um, the argument revolving around the non-identity problem um, by first talking about the idea that identity is fixed by um, sort of the time that a person is um, conceived. So the basic idea just being uh, if you didn't come from the same parents at relatively about the same time you wouldn't be the person that you are numerically you'd be a totally different person which we talked about and it's a little complicated there's a lot to discuss there and you know obviously lots and lots of debate around that idea of whether or not origin is necessary for identity but it seems pretty intuitive at least that um you have to have the same sperm and egg to be the same person and if there were a different sperm then it would not be the same person um, who was conceived so that means then I have a the question I have a, I have a question for for Christians does this mean that there are many soul options and God just waits for whichever sperm and egg combination works and then he like chooses of the many potential like hundreds of thousand combinations of soul options and then just shoots them down into the nutsack yeah I mean and aren't souls supposed to be qualitatively simple like they don't have any qualities besides I guess the identity. <laughs> I don't know. Real quick, though, I do just realize that I said it shoots him down into the nutsack, and I am aware that babies <laughs> do not grow inside the nutsack. That would be very painful. Because <laughs> uh, I was thinking of the little sperm, but I guess that's not when the soul conception happens. It's the moment when sperm meets egg. So, not in the nutsack, but you know what I mean. So, sorry. Continue on. <laughs> um. Now I'm just thinking about nut sacks. What were we talking about? Oh, yeah. Origin is necessary for identity. <laughs> yeah. Um, so regardless of whichever, uh, uh, you have to have the same nut sack to be the same person. That's the basic <laughs> idea, right? Um, right. If it's the case that origin is necessary for identity, which seems pretty intuitive, and at least we're going to work with that for now. Um, if that's the case, that means that if choices, sort of governmental policy type choices, affect when people... Uh, when parents conceive, that will those choices will actually affect the identity of who actually exists in the world. So you can think about, for instance, um, if uh, say a couple's together and they decide at 21 years old um, they want to conceive because they have good jobs at their college or whatever and they can afford to have a baby. Or in a different scenario where maybe um, they're loaded down with student debt, they decide, well, we can't have a kid at 21. Um, instead, we're going to wait until we're 30. And so they wait until they're 30 and then have a kid then. Um, 
when we're when you're making that choice, reviewing that choice from the outside, you kind of assume that it's the same baby they're talking about. We're going to have this baby A at 21 or this baby A <laughs> at 30. But actually, according yeah. to Parfit, if origin is necessary for identity, it would be actually baby A at 21 or baby B at 30. It'd be a wholly different person numerically um, between those two babies. So we don't think about choices as being that way. But in actuality, if origin is necessary for identity, they are that way. Uh, in fact, waiting from 21 years old to 21 years old in one day would probably um, be sufficient for having an entirely different person. Um, and then there's even a causal sense in which by delaying, let's say, conception at 21 to 31, that they're actually causing uh, a different... What would you even say like they're actually causing different personages to exist, right? Yeah. They're yeah, actually you're... like... It's it's a causal, it's it's actually like a direct causal relation um, in that future baby that they do decide to have. Yeah, basically every choice you make that has any effect at all on when a person is conceived, anybody is conceived, will make somebody not exist and somebody else exist. Yeah, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Like literally, you could yeah, and then wave at somebody, and if that delays them for five seconds from where they're going to go, that could affect the rest of their life in such a way that someone else is born down the line that wouldn't have been born and someone who would have been born isn't born. Yeah, and then and then you could even expand this to say that like the way that you treat your body while, you know, the fetus is in development or something like that, like if you drink or you smoke or you don't drink or you eat certain types of foods or whatever that you're actually causing effects on that future personhood. 20 years down the line, 50 years down the line, whatever. Uh, as far as who, like their progeny? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't change the person who's in the womb, right? Because they're already conceived. But it would change any future persons that come down from that, you know, that line, genetic line. Right. Yeah, so mm -hmm. if that's the idea, and... Um, uh, Parvit's talking about this, this general idea of different number choices, he calls them, or choices that affect um, the number and the identities of the people who exist. Obviously, lots of governmental policy will have these sorts of effects, right? We just talked about the example of student loans. Forgiving student loans, for instance, would have a huge effect on when people choose to conceive and will therefore affect who actually exists in the world and, of course, how many people exist in the world. Um, and things we, we know that it affects the number of people, right? But we're always we don't usually have in our mind the idea that our choices will affect the actual identities of the people who exist, um, who actually exists versus who doesn't. So this leads to the non-identity problem, which states that um, we tend to think that when we're enacting some sort of policy, um, Parfit uses the examples he calls them conservation and depletion. So this is back in the 80s, so this is before climate change was a huge scenario, but you can basically input climate change type scenarios into these terms. Conservation will be something like reducing um, fuel fo uh, fossil fuel emissions, and depletion would be something like going on the status quo as far as uh, fossil fuel emissions. And so if we choose um, conservation, then we're going to change who actually exists in the future. And uh, very many ways. In fact, Parfit says something like, we can basically guarantee that within a few generations, um, conservation and depletion have entirely different sets of people who exist, um, which is, you know, the math he uses is kind of like weird and, and you know, back of the napkin, but it's probably basically true that uh, under these two scenarios that within a few generations, because of how drastic uh, choices are going to be different in those two scenarios, we're going to have wholly different sets of, of people in the two. And so if you view these two scenarios like that, um, a problem emerges, which is the fact that in depletion, we think depletion is obviously wrong because in some sense we're um, leaving a, a bad world um, for future people. And I think everyone who believes that climate change is a thing thinks that, right? Kind of follows, almost follows necessarily from the idea that um, we're making the environment worse, that it's, gonna, it's worse because it's affecting future persons in a, in a, in a negative way. The problem is, if we hadn't done depletion, if we had done conservation instead, the people who exist in the depletion scenario wouldn't have existed at all. Mm -hmm. So if you compare the non-existent scenario for them to the depletion scenario for them, 
as long as they have lives that are at least barely worth living, if that's better than not existing at all, then they're actually not worse off in the depletion scenario than they would be otherwise. Which is why this whole idea of um, different identities in different scenarios is so unique and different than the way we normally think about things, right? If we think about conservation and we think about depletion as these two possible future scenarios, we tend to think it's the same people in each of them, right? It's person mm-hmm. one, two, and three in conservation and person one, two, and three in depletion. And that we're talking about conservation is better because it's better for person one, two, and three than it is than depletion is for one, two, and three. But actually, conservation includes people one, two, and three, and depletion includes people four, five, and six. And so you can't well, actually we, compare the same scenarios for the same persons. Yeah, and could we also say it's not just simply that you have, you know, one set, person one, two, and three, and second set, person four, five, and six, but you also have context A versus context B, and those contexts themselves are also radically different. So it's not just that the people themselves are different, but the conditions under which those people too. So there's still a relational concern that's going on here, right? So because someone might say, well, yeah, but but the world itself would just be objectively in a particular type of condition that is bad for any potential person. But the point is, is that no, that doesn't necessarily follow because persons are adaptable under different conditions. And there's always like a relational sense in which um, a situation is bad in the context in which a person is making the judgment that it's good or bad, right? Yeah. I, mean, I think if I see what you're going for here, um, instead of saying – You know, depletion is bad for persons one, two, and three, because if persons one, two, and three were in conservation, they'd be better off. Profits are removing that line of argument because they wouldn't exist. Persons one, two, three wouldn't exist in conservation, right? Um, Instead, you could say, and this is actually Profit's line, is to say, yeah, but depletion is worse overall for anybody than conservation Mm -hmm. is, regardless of who exists in the scenario. And so therefore, conservation is better. And he calls this the total impersonal principle. I think is what he calls it. He has weird names for these things. Uh, or the impersonal. Yeah, I like how he principle. just like fucking throws out these terms. Like I should know them already. He's like, that's the this principle. And I'm like, wait, is that like an <laughs> historically used term that I should know? You know, he just makes no, them up. I, they're very descriptive, though. I appreciate it. So many times are. people come up with names for things that have no relation to the content of the actual term. But he doesn't do that. <laughs> Literally, it's called the repugnant conclusion. You already know you're supposed to reject it. <laughs> so yeah his solution to the non-identity problem is this impersonal total principle idea that um we're not allowed to say that depletion is bad because it's bad for the persons who are in it compared to otherwise which is normally how we think about these things um that move is sort of taken off the off the table given the non-identity problem so instead Parvet says we have to say no depletion is bad compared to conservation because it's bad for whoever exists. It doesn't matter who it is. That's the impersonal part of it, right? It doesn't matter um, that it's not bad for any single person or any set of persons. It's just bad overall, impersonally speaking. So he wants to say that we can say things are bad um, without saying it's bad for a particular person or any particular people. And so that's That's the basic... Yeah, that's an interesting claim. I'm not sure I like that. No, I mean, that's basically a setup for being... Like a consequentialist, right? Because you want to talk about yeah um, the, the overall consequences of a thing being bad, regardless of who it's bad for. Um, and so there's all sorts of ways. We talked a bit about last week about how you can deal with the non-identity problem. Um, and obviously the idea that you can wrong someone and harm somebody without making them worse off is the key uh, to that. Harper just kind of assumes that um, the only way you can wrong or harm somebody is by making them worse off. And that's just patently false but the yeah. thing but we can move now to the repugnant conclusion um even the total impersonal principle which he thinks resolves the non-identity problem doesn't resolve this further problem in fact i think the repugnant conclusion is a problem for the impersonal uh principle more so than anything else and that's why it's interesting that harvard brings it mm-hmm. up and, and kind of doesn't really have much of a solution to it at least here so the basic idea behind the repugnant conclusion is this You can imagine a society A, and it has fewer people um, but greater average happiness than this other society B, which has many more people but lesser average happiness than A. So if you want to, like, we're talking about um, sort of whole groups of people, so it's not really helpful technically to talk about, like, countries, right? 
But uh, you can use that as sort of a heuristic if that helps you picture things. You can think of like um, a very large society but has lesser average happiness, like um, United States or China or something. And then a smaller society that has greater average happiness or welfare or whatever. And maybe that's like, you know, Norway or Denmark or something. Um, and so you ask, well, which outcome would be better, all things, all else sort of being equal? And of course, the intuitive thing is to say, well, I'd, you know, especially if I'm picking where I'd rather live, I'd rather be in like mm-hmm. Denmark, right? Not, not including things like weather and, and quantity of black metal bands and whatnot. Um, but just in terms of like whatever, you know, average happiness or what makes life worth living or whatever, I would want to be in a society that has more of that, right? On average. Um, so then the question is, Parfit asks, well, could this be in any sense morally outweighed by the fact that there are more people living in B? Like, is there any amount uh, of people having the happiness or the whatever makes life worth living that would eventually outweigh the fact that um, in, a, in a sort of less populous society, there's greater average happiness? And the impersonal total principle seems to say yes, right? Like, if we're valuing conservation because there's a greater amount of happiness, regardless of who has it in it, than depletion, then it seems like we're kind of holding a principle which says, well, it's a consequentialist principle, something like the total amount of whatever makes life worth living makes a society or a world or whatever better than one that has less of that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we accept that, you know, if a society has lesser average happiness but has way, way more people, then eventually it's going to be better than a society with fewer people who has greater average happiness. Then we're led into the, what he calls the repugnant conclusion, because this means that for any possible population that has a very high quality of life, there's going to be a much larger imaginable population whose existence would be better, even though its members have lives that are barely worth living. So, any society you can think of, you can always think of a better society that has more people with less happiness on average to the point where you will eventually get to like the greatest number you can possibly think of with you know, 0. 0.00001 whatever quality of life, just barely the point of um, being above worth living. And that's the repugnant conclusion. That's basically the impersonal total principle seems to say we should continually increase um, population until basically we have the most possible people we can have that won't make life not worth living anymore for people. <laughs> and that seems completely absurd and repugnant. Yeah. But it seems to follow. Uh, yeah. I mean, and does he ever like sit down and use, I know he's got those graphs where, or like the bars, like the bar graphs that he uses where like, you know, society A is like really skinny, but tall and then society b is a little bit wider and not quite as tall and what is it like society z i think it is it's like yeah i love that it's z (laughs) i know yeah he just like skips he goes like a b c z um and z is like just extremely wide and no no height whatsoever because it's vast in population but very poor quality of life um i mean is it just as simple as saying like so let's say there are a million people in uh, society A, and their quality of life is, I mean, what would we say, an eight, right? Eight out of ten. So yeah, so eight out of ten. So that, that's eight million total. Like, is is that how he does it? And then yeah, yeah. you've got I mean, society he, Z. That's not how he does. In society yeah, Z, calculate it. Yeah. Okay, in society Z, they have eight million people, but their quality of life is one. And that equals 8 million, so they're equal. But that's cool. Just have one more baby in Society Z, and now you've got 8 million one, and so you win. So Society Z is actually better because it just has a higher quantity, a higher numerical value on this calculus. Yeah? I mean, that, yeah, that actually kind of sounds like Society B. So like, if Society A had a million people with 8 out of 10 quality of life, Society B would have something like... Um, a hundred million people with a one out of 10 quality of life, which is lesser on average in society A, but greater in total quantity, right? But then you could even think of society Z, which would be like the greatest number you can think of people who could fit on earth while still allowing that they have a a quality of life that's above 0.0001, 
right? So it's yeah, like it's most just as society as yeah. is like the end point where like any more people than this would mean quality of life is now zero or less than zero. And now we no longer have a um a better world or whatever. Which is just the very idea that we would want to increase like that it would be the end goal to increase population to as many people as possible until we have a negative quality of life seems absurd, right? Do you think it matters to I mean, to me it matters, but I mean, to Parfit, do you think it matters to, to explore how it is that we determine what this notion of quality of life, like how we determine what that even means? Because, yes, I mean, he, bas he basically yeah. has this this fun little philosophical thing, and this is kind of like, an, a, you can t kind of speak to this, I think, an economistic type of move to say, yeah. I don't know what the quality of life is, I'm not claiming I know what it is, so I'm just going to refer to it as X. Like he literally says, whatever makes life worth living as like a variable for whatever you want to input into that, because whatever you choose about that, it's still going to function. Um, this problem will still function the same way. He's assuming, of course, that it's, you know, quantifiable. Uh, even if we don't know how to quantify it, it is quantifiable, mm. whatever it is. Yeah. What makes life worth living? I mean, it just seems to me like such a socially contingent and culturally contingent concept so i uh i went out and i had dinner and was hanging with a buddy of mine tonight and if he's listening what up brendan um but he uh he jokingly has this well, i don't actually how much of it i think he actually does have the bracelet i think his wife got it for him but it's um what would hunter gatherers do so instead of what would jesus do it's ww <laughs> hgd like, because he's obsessed with, uh, like, pre-agricultural society and whatnot. And so we had, like, a long chat tonight. And usually whenever we get together and hang, we, we somehow get into this topic where we talk about the, the vast difference, um, without being too repetitive here, the qualitative difference between, let's say, uh, pre-agricultural, pre-civilizational, like think Jared Diamond stuff. We talked about Jared Diamond on a podcast episode a long time ago for people that remember that. But like, you know, like a, a society that doesn't, that isn't defined by all the ills that certain people attach to the, that are introduced with agriculturalism, you know, like social stratification and gender divisions and, um, you know, a greater propensity towards uh, scarcity and then competition because of scarcity and mimetic rivalry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? But if you have a society prior to that, um, whether this is mythical or not, let's just say that it's historical reality, that's such a qualitatively different cultural and societal framework that how they would determine what makes life worth living seems to be so vastly different than, say, a, our particular society, what, what what makes life worth living is, I don't know, um, easing discomfort, you know, making connections. Like, what what is it? I mean, are those things just universal principles? Are those like, are, do they universally, do they transcend cultural context and societal context? And I'm not sure that they do. And I think, yeah, I think, and I think if we start thinking that way, then I think that really problematizes the entire calculus. I think Parfit's response to that, and, you know, I don't, agree with him on this, but would be something like, sure, the the means with which we get what makes life worth living differs in different cultural contexts. But in the end, it's going to be the same. Like the end goal of that means is going to be something like happiness or welfare or whatever, right? And so- Or conatus get, or something, like to you just might persist get, in your being. Yeah. But you might get welfare from different sources and different cultures. That's fine, right? That's pluralistic. But the welfare at the end is the thing. That's just basically synonymous with you know quality of life. So you could even make this problem um, in such a way or develop it in such a way that it, it takes account of the different cultural contexts, I would think, um, such that you have quality of life um, or the means to getting quality of life different in different cultural contexts and still increasing the number of people to the point where you have the most possible quality of life. So I'm not sure that I'm not sure that well, but this whole... is what I mean. I do you think that everybody even thinks in this term that that life is worth living, right? To even think in those terms, I think that presumes a certain. It already kind of values life within a particular way, so it seems kind of 
Um, there is a little bit of like question begging here, it seems. In terms of what? Well, so, so I'm trying to think even the very idea, the assumption that, that life is worth living, um, seems to, to necessitate that some sort of like qualitative importance about life itself in a self-reflective sense, right? So what like I'm wondering think about is, this makes life worth living, this wouldn't kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but like what if what if we engaged in different types of thinking that that weren't even self-reflective like that? That didn't even contemplate that life was worth living. Now, he might say that like okay, in such a scenario, nevertheless people are still living. Therefore, there's some sort of like maybe assumed sense in which life is worth living. But I don't know. I feel like in order to engage at the analytical and the self-reflective and the kind of philosophical experiment, you kind of have to make a forceful move. You have to inscribe and encode particular patterns of living into one that is already like analyzable from within this framework. And so I think that there's there's kind of like this, um, like Laura Well would call it the principle of sufficient philosophy, right? It's that decision that you make that already overcodes or codes, let's say, um, the framework or I'm sorry, that, that frames the pro or that includes the problem into a particular established framework. And I feel like that's kind of what's going on here, right? With this assumption. And and I'm only like being weird and like splitting hairs because um I'm just really hung up on this like assumption that that you can just kind of uh well one, that you can quantify things, but two, that there's just this bedrock that can be categorized as X that you don't know but yet you can make such a bold statement about it, you know? Yeah, it, it certainly claiming that the variable assumes that whatever you input into that variable, um, all the different options are going to be very similar uh, in the sense in which they're quantifiable. Yeah. Like, I think it is the case that quality of life is somewhat quantifiable. Like, I can look at two scenarios of, and then judge what my life would be like in them and think one is, is better because it has more of something that's good. Uh, overall, you can do that. I just don't think that that's really how we look at um, life in total and a life worth living. I don't think we really do quantify things in quite that way. Um, and I definitely don't think that the quantity of the thing that we're discussing is something like happiness or pleasure or um, something like that, right? Uh, it's yeah. it's something that's it's much more um, sort of sort of unique to our own um, decisions and goals as individual agents, right? Like if I look at different mm -hmm. scenarios, I'm going to think about, well, you know, how could I, am I able to like read books and converse with friends and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that? And it's not because those things bring me more pleasure. I mean, if I wanted more pleasure, I would go somewhere that has like the best gelato in the world, right? Uh, which maybe I should just do that anyway. Um <laughs> And I get pleasure from the former things, right? Of course, that's not the reason why I do them. I do them because I find them meaningful. Um, sometimes they don't bring me pleasure at all. Reading Parfit doesn't necessarily bring me a whole lot of pleasure, but I find it <laughs> meaningful. It makes me think about stuff and thinking is hard. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I think you're right that there's something about using this, this quality of life thing as a variable, which kind of assumes that every different sort of ethical system is going to be able to input their own their own, um, their own like system into that variable, and you can just plug it in and then move on, right? And that seems kind of like a wrong assumption. Yeah. Like, no, the different ethical systems are vastly more different than just what you input into that variable of what counts as quality of life. Yeah, I mean, what's the next step for Parfit after the repug repugnant conclusion? Like, what does he do here? I mean, not much. I think in, okay. in his later book on what matters, he addresses a little bit more about how you might deal with this. I haven't read that though. Um, yeah, this is kind of a problem for his own system, for the idea of having uh, sort of impersonally based reasons for ethical action, um, not about how it affects individual persons, but instead how it affects you know the whole of which persons are a part. And so the repugnant conclusion, it's... He names it that, I think, because he's like, this is kind of follows from the view that I'm touting, but it's awful. <laughs> so we need to find a way to reject it. And he refers to this thing called like theory X or something as the theory which will account for why the repugnant conclusion is repugnant or why it's wrong or should be rejected. 
but it's theory X because I don't know what the theory is yet, but we got to get to it because this is obviously a bad conclusion. Hmm. What is, where does he go from here in the book? Because this is only like what chapter 20 or something like that. I mean, he goes fucking everywhere. He talks about, but he doesn't like before, but he doesn't like pick this up and say, all right, well now that we've established the repugnant conclusion, now we're going to, see what that means next because these the two chapters you know what is it 19 and 20 or whatever it is the one preceding repugnant conclusion they are tied together the, the one on nine, non-identity in this one but like yeah, the next non-identity one does and just... repugnant conclusion but he, he basically just he talks about like the mirror edition paradox which comes after this which is kind of like a um it kind of makes more unique and distinct the problem he rejects like the idea of um averaging out happiness as a problem the, the obvious reason okay. that um, if average happiness is what matters, then you could actually just like remove people from the system and increase the average. <laughs> That's right? so funny. Which would eventually actually lead you to have one person, like, and that one person who has the highest happiness would make that greatest average happiness, which is a huge problem. Um, yeah. <laughs> and stuff like that. So you just kind of so like, fucked up. I know, right? <laughs> Um, that would actually make a really good dystopian sci-fi plot, wouldn't it? Yeah, it sounds like an Ursula K. Le Guin novel, right? A short story. Yeah. Just find whoever has the least happiness in society and off them to increase the average. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I mean, huh. this is basically the end of the book then at that point. Um, okay. And so I think what he holds is we should still have this impersonal, impersonality idea or impersonal reasons for... Um, for for action, but then the repugnant conclusion is kind of left as like the open problem, which is a pretty big fucking big open problem. Yeah, I mean, do you within his system it's a problem? Do you buy it that it is a problem, or do you just see that it's within his system it's a problem, but that you can just kind of be like, yeah, but the system kind of falls apart ultimately, so we look elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, I have other reasons for rejecting a kind of consequentialist. Um, view of you know normative ethics, but I think this is another like reason to reject it. I think this is kind of just like a reductio of the system, right? The idea that we should just have at least of the total part of the impersonal total principle. I think the impersonal part's wrong too for other reasons, but the total part, the idea that we can just sort of total up um, the quality of lives, the qualities of life things, or whatever, um, and then consider a world better because it has more of those. It's just not, it's not even how we, anybody thinks about things, right? Like we don't look at um, some ancient society or whatever and be like, yeah, but we're judging its quality or whatever. Like, yeah, but how many people did it have, right? Like what was the total uh, quality of life? You know, the sum, aggregate of all of it. Like we just, no one thinks about things that way. And you, and, uh, you shouldn't always appeal to like our intuitions about these things as being proof of what's right and what's wrong. But it should clue us into the fact, I think, that this is just not how we think about things at all. So obviously it would be bad if society existed, right? Um, and there's really no way around that. Although there is something to say about, I mean, I don't know if it's the same. Uh, well, first of all, I, before I get into that, because I'm not sure it fits, but it just popped into my head and I want to bring it up. But uh, first thing, is he like the only philosopher to ever use reductio against himself? <laughs> like, Well, no, I mean, usually, certainly. Like usually. At, okay. <laughs> Regret. Usually people do it like against other people, but he's kind of like, <laughs> hey man, my own argument itself when taken to its most extreme is fucking repugnant. So moving on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I think Parfit was actually, you know, I, I apologize if I'm wrong about this, but I think he was autistic um, or maybe like Asperger's or something. And so I kind of appreciate that he's, and you can kind of see this in his writing, right? Like he just lays out stuff out there and he doesn't give a shit if it speaks against his view or not, right? Um, <laughs> he's just kind of like laying out all the pieces, right? And ordering yeah. them in a certain way. And I really appreciate the kind of like honesty of it. Like he's not bullshitting at, least, at the very least. Um, like so many philosophers try to, right? And it, it kind of makes you, it kind of weirds you out at first when reading it because the way he writes, it kind of, we talked about last week, kind of reads almost like an undergraduate, the simplicity mm -hmm. of the writing. But then... I think it's kind of a virtue of it that it's just it's right there on the page. It's, you don't have to like try and like work to interpret it. He literally puts the like evaluative content in the name of the term. It's a repugnant conclusion, <laughs> right? Hmm, hmm. Um, I kind of dig that. I appreciate it. I don't know if I could read only that style of writing. 
Um, but uh, I appreciate that it's just out there. Yeah. Um, now, what do you think about, you know, because obviously we do live in a world that does use data and various metrics to determine like the well-being of societies, you know, things that we should criticize like GDP, for example, as being a measure of a nation's wealth, well-being, vitality, production prowess, etc. Um, you know, which, you know, they're not good markers generally um, yeah. because they don't have any kind of holistic or qualitative concerns. And so there are all kinds of other metrics, you know, that people try to implement, like, well, what about gross national happiness, which I think also is kind of an odd metric, but maybe it's getting us in a better direction at least. But, um, but I wonder how we could think about, like, let's just say GDP, for example, from within this type of consequentialist uh, ethic that he's establishing. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to talk about this too and have some things I want to um, pick your brain about. But yeah, like the obvious problem with like a gross domestic product and weighing that as the quality of a society is one, uh, why would we assume that that's a measure of what's good? And then two, that doesn't talk about the distribution of whatever it is that it's measuring. Right, it could be extremely um, unequal, and that seems to be a problem too. Right, like you can have a very high gross domestic product, and only one person has all of it. You know, so you have feudal systems, for instance, you could <laughs> measure different uh, manners or whatever, and then determine the the greatest uh, uh, feudal land. But then it could be that the lord has all the wealth, and never no one else does. Um, mm. and, but the issue is, if you replace that with like a like a gross national happiness or whatever. Um, maybe you're getting closer to measuring what's good, right? Um, but then, of course, you're not measuring the distribution of that goodness. That's a problem. Um, and then also, there's this huge problem about, well, what does it mean to measure happiness? Like people yeah. probably don't have a very good view of even how happy they are. I remember, you know, so it's, the Scandinavian countries always score very high on these happiness ind indices. Um, and I remember watching this documentary that was like went to um, Denmark and started interviewing people and asking them about what they think about the fact that they're so high on these happiness indices every year. Um, and it was so funny because they're just like a lot of people, and maybe this is all just, you know, anecdotal evidence or whatever, but most people were just like, we don't really understand or get it. Like, it doesn't seem that big a deal. Like actually people in Scandinavia tend to be kind of morose and, um, and a little bit downtrodden. And so, we don't think of ourselves as like running through the streets, like, you know, um, uh, like Bacchanalia or whatever. And it's like drinking wine and having sex and, you know, <laughs> listening to heavy metal or whatever. Um, and that I think points to something really important, right? Like people, like we, there's probably a lot more partying that happens in America than happens in, in Scandinavia. Um, but that doesn't necessarily make people happy or self-reflective about their happiness or whatever. And so it's really difficult to think about what makes you think that you're happy. And then is thinking that you're happy actually mean that you are? Like if you actually were happy or content or satisfied or uh, whatever term you want to use, an objectively, you know, life full of welfare, what would that say? Like, how would you respond to that? Would you respond to it by thinking of yourself as being a 10 out of 10 happy or content or whatever? Or would you have a somewhat more balanced um, view of the uh, view of it? I, I don't even know how any of that. That's, a lot of that's like psychological questions, right? Um, yeah, I don't know how that would work. So I'm not even sure how you'd begin to start measuring a thing like that. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, what you're talking about are more like those those like happiness polls that they do every year, which is a little bit different than like you know what what Bhutan does with their GNH, which is their gross mm -hmm. national happiness metric, which theirs is much more rigorous. Theirs has uh, like four pillars of the GNH. I'm just reading something right now. It's sustainable well, and equitable. Ob objective lists of like welfare, right? They don't poll people yeah. about their own happiness. Well, they do. Um, they do look into subjective survey based things as well. So they do. Okay. They do. Yeah, they do talk about like resilience and living standards and um, psychological well-being and things like that as well. But they have both subjective and objective measures as well. 
But yeah, but yeah, that's my thing too. I always wonder like, so like, you know, um, you can look at, uh, you know, social support systems and things like that as being used as an objective measure of a community's gross national happiness. Um, you know, are people in want, economic inequality, things like that. Access to clean water. I mean, those would be like basic things, right? Clothing, housing, affordable housing, public transportation, pollution, air quality content. And that's something that obviously is really close to home for me right now since our air quality has been hazardous, like literally. I'm not being rhetorical. It has literally been <laughs> hazardous uh, the last couple days and then last week and week before too. But, um, you know, stuff like that. But yeah, I always wonder that too. Like, how do people know whether or not they're happy? And what the fuck does happy mean? Happy in relation to what? We talked about this last week when I was mentioning like my ex in LA that like she experienced lows that were lower than me. Well, people also experience highs that are higher than others. So what if like there were some quantifiable way to measure the average Danish dude's happiness and his happiness is like a six, but because he lives in a morose downtrodden society that's dark for six months out of the year, he thinks that he's really fucking happy. So he tells him like, yeah, I'm really fucking happy. <laughs> but nevertheless, like the amount of dopamine rushes or whatever the fuck, I don't know how you would even measure it, but like the amount of ecstatic evenings that he's had and the amount of like crazy um wonderful passionate sexual encounters or amazing concerts that he's seen that have created those ecstatic instances are far fewer than like mine for example and so i'm like an, an eight but i'm upset because he's feeling a six and for him like a six feels like a 10 but for me an eight feels well off from a 10 you know so like he yeah, feels I mean like he feels like he's happy as fuck but maybe like actually he's not as happy as me relative to maybe the the height the highs that i have but relative to his expectations maybe he's more at ease so to speak yeah and that introduces the question of should we aim for like self-reflective accounts of happiness being greater or the <laughs> actual right. thing that we think we're sort of incorrectly measuring when we measure our own happiness because um, we, we found out that there wasn't a sort of direct parallel between the two or a direct function between the two then that would create this problem, right? Do we want people to think they're happier or people to actually be happier even if they don't think that they are? <laughs> yeah, so that's th a good question. All this question. Leads, to the, leads to the problem is just like, we, we just shouldn't think about governments as existing for that reason. Like governments don't exist to make people happy. Like they exist mm. to serve certain functions, clearly, right? Um, maybe one of those is to provide conditions that we can then seek happiness amongst many other things, right? But it doesn't seem like they should exist for the sake of, as a direct function of, you know, uh, creating happiness in people. That just seems impossible on one end, but then also just just wrong. We don't don't think about um, governments and, and and you know policy goals as existing for that reason, right? So, okay, this is really interesting, and one of the things that I think is really problematic, and this kind of connects us back to your shitty minute. So, one of the things that you get with socialists is uh, Marxist types, socialist types, particularly the Jacobin types, is this idea that psychological well-being necessarily falls from social support systems. Now, I'm not contesting that at one level, right? Uh, it does. It is the fact that if you are impoverished, you do, as a child, you do produce higher levels of cortisol and stress, and those things can... Um, uh, solidify into your actual chemical framework and uh, it can lead to a life of dealing with higher levels of stress anxiety um, depression etc 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 it is also the case that if you don't have to worry about you know precarious employment options before you that yes you will have diminished stress and things like that like that does that that is the case right um, and there are all those like results that came out when, what was it? Like fucking Finland was doing the UBI and it was like, oh my God, all of these people are like, have reduced stress and they're like reporting positive psychological, uh, benefits from being on the UBI and stuff like that. So yes, great. But one of the things that I do think is potentially problematic is, is that a lot of times Marxists do use this argument and it's the argument that you just said that maybe that there's a sense in which the government is intended to kind of nurture that psychological well-being. So what I wonder is, do you think that's a problem, kind of, that somehow psychologists are playing the pop, I'm sorry, that somehow socialists are playing the pop psychology game, and that they're trying too hard to buy into the feel-good 
mantras that have existed in 20th century pop psychology, now 21st century pop psychology, and they're trying to incorporate that into what should be um, a different set of concerns that still deal with species being or material well-being, but that doesn't focus so much on just like being happy and, you know, feeling good, which I think you do find like Baskar, uh, I've seen him write about this and some of the Jacobin crew write about this um, a little bit. What do you think? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I do think that that um, socialists tend to fall in this uh, into this trap sometimes. And you know, it's obviously the case that one of the reasons government exists is to increase welfare, right, in people. Um, and I, I say welfare instead of like psychological well-being because I want to talk yeah. about the the objective thing and not your own account of what that thing is. Um, but that's not the only reason it exists, and clearly. The welfare itself is largely a means to something else, right? Like we want to have um, welfare so that we can engage in the various projects that we want to engage in, right? Mm. Um, like, I mean, what's the famous line from Marx that I'm going to be like a uh, a fisherman in the morning and an artist in the uh, afternoon and a critic in the evening or whatever it is? Um, Fuck yes. Yeah, like th the reason why we want the welfare is so we can engage in these various projects that we want to engage in, right? Uh, yeah. together with others and part part of like being able to do that a condition of doing that is like being relatively stress-free and having uh, means and all the things that you know um, a social organization can help provide right and mm. sometimes we get caught in this trap of of talking about creating the welfare and then not thinking at all about what the reason to create that welfare is mm. and that seems yeah, pretty that's important and we don't have to always be talking about that, right? Like certainly there's a case we're just talking about the first part of the, the formula. Um, but then if we start viewing that as the only thing, I mean, you fall right back into like our opponent conclusion type of thing where, okay, we'll create the most uh, total welfare, but then we have society Z and that seems like it sucks. <laughs> I wonder how, like there's an interesting critique here. I wonder if you could write an article. I'm putting this charge to you, Troy. If you could write a Jacobin article using the repugnant conclusion to kind of like try to challenge Jacobin readers to press the conversation to deeper levels and not just simply fall into this potentially uh, consequentialist logic. Yeah, that sounds like it's right up my alley, right? <laughs> it does, dude. That just sounds fucking perfect, man. I mean, think about... The reason society Z sucks isn't just because it has less average welfare or whatever for people, uh, or excuse me, that has uh, less average but you know greater total uh, welfare for people, right? The reason it sucks is because if you were in society Z, you wouldn't be able to do anything. Like your your life would be barely worth living, and you'd be so worried about the possibility of it going below zero that you wouldn't be able to like do all the shit you want to do, right? And that's what's important about it, right? Society A is cool because because you're you know you have enough welfare to where you can basically do what you want to do. You can like make music and you can create shit and hang out with friends and you know help people, not have to worry about the fact that you know if you help them, then they're going to take advantage of you or whatever. Like all the good things in life that we care about are possible in that world, and they're not in society Z. That's what's important about it, right? Not the welfare itself, but what the welfare is a means towards. Are you saying that Society A is fully automated gay space communism? Fully automated gay space communism. That's fully automated gay space lug fully automated and, gay space luxury communism. Forgot and once that. all the kids read Fanon, then they're gonna be into luxury gay space communism. And this all starts with to get it. free education. <laughs> <laughs> Problem solved. It's my favorite thing, dude, when people think that all the kids are going to become Marxists if they go to free public college. Like we can't even get kids to read the texts, let alone internalize it and become Marxists. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Let alone all the kids who will just be you know, being business majors and whatnot. Yeah. That's, that's what I meant when I said that, like all other things staying the same, like you gotta, you gotta change other stuff too, because that's, what's going to happen is you're just going to have a bunch of free public education. that's just making like a bunch of wall street bros, you know? <laughs> well, the wall street bros will still come from the Ivies and stuff. Right. But, uh, no, yeah, man, they come from San education. Diego state. They're in Sigma <laughs> Chi and shit like that. Like, 
that's where well i mean i mean maybe like the gold goldman sachs wall street bros but you know like you know it, there's all kinds of traders and commercial lenders and shit like that around the world that uh, are gonna they're gonna the middle class wall that. street bros who's gonna that's actually right. make a yeah. movie about the middle class wall street bros <laughs> Sounds like something I should do. So you've got your yeah, assignment like, for Jacobin, and I've got my movie assignment. <laughs> yeah, like Silicon Valley is that for tech bros, right? It's like the middle class tech bros, but they need to have that about Wall Street. I mean, I'm not kidding, man. I grew up with, I mean, they wouldn't be Wall Street because they would be like, you know how there's like Broadway and then off Broadway? This would be like the equivalent of off Wall Street, but they're still like finance bros, but they're just Southern California finance bros. And yes, yeah, some of them went to UCLA. Some of them went to Berkeley. Probably the guys who are like the lead portfolio managers and securities analysts and things like that, but not necessarily. You know, some of them just went to Pepperdine. Um, not just, I'm not slagging off Pepperdine. Some of them went to Pepperdine. <laughs> some of them went to San Diego State, you know, UCSB, you know, decent universities, but they're not necessarily like... The elite, they didn't go to Penn, you know, or yeah. fucking Columbia or Harvard or Yale or whatever, you know. Maybe there's like one or two people at the bank, like the CFO who went to Princeton, but not necessarily, you know. Those business development officers. Yeah, I'm into that, dude. I want to see that. Yeah, dude. And they're, they're, it's my bros, man. It's the guys that I grew up with. So I should fucking, it's, you know what I could do? I could mix, it would be like the big short meets silicon valley meets um what was it the real Entourage. bros of simi real bros of simi valley oh dude real bros of simi valley is where it's at it would definitely be like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then entourage and then it would and it would be based around like an entourage of a few dudes yeah so but definitely like real bros of simi valley is the urtext of the middle class bros right yeah it's just doing yeah. that with oc bros all right, so listeners, please go to patreon.com slash owls at dawn to support and finance <laughs> this film project. <laughs> the real bros of Wall Street. That's it, dude. The real bros of off Wall Street. Of off Wall Street. There we go. <laughs> uh, all right, is there anything you want to say in conclusion about the repugnant conclusion? Nah, I think we covered it. Yeah, I think so but too. If, cool, but cool. if y'all have thoughts, definitely send them our way. We'd love to discuss this further, especially me. Please do. Our friends. All right, so now we're going to do the sticky leaves segment. This is where one of us talks about whatever it is that's giving us meaning in a potentially meaningless world. So, other than what is welfare a means to in your world, mm -hmm. Austin? Um, so, I think I've mentioned this, but I've been swimming a lot, right? Yeah. And it's one of those things where I mean, I really hope, I really hope this isn't just a fad for me, but I really hope, because I do love it. I've grew, I grew up swimming. Um, I didn't grow up swimming for exercise, but I was always in the water and then always in the pool. I mean, shit, my summers were so ridiculous when I was younger. It was like, go to the beach all day and then sometimes you stay at night, but sometimes come home and then just go to the pool or the jacuzzi at night. Like, yeah, I was just in water all the fucking time. Like, it was ridiculous, right? Um... But I, I have been loving actually swimming uh, quite intensely over the past, I guess, we'll say five weeks now, something like that, um, you know, four or five weeks. And I've been swimming quite a bit. Uh, I'm actually, I'm getting tattooed in like 10 days, so I'm trying to swim every day because it's going to be about another month after I get tattooed. Uh, before I can swim again. So I'm, I'm also trying to get all of my time in. But then I'm thinking, you know what, maybe a month break will be nice because then I won't burn myself out on it. But like I, I'm absolutely in love with it. And it's one of these really strange things because uh, you know how when someone picks up a hobby, like I remember one of my best friends, a guy named Jeff, uh, one, of, one of the bros that I used to hang with. He's not a finance guy though. But um, uh, <laughs> one of my buddies, Jeff, his dad, I think, I'm pretty sure this is true because I, I only met him like at around this time, but I'm pretty sure it was new for him at the time. But he was having like, he went through a divorce when he was in like his 40s and then he got really into Harleys and he now has like multiple Harleys and then he got really into like going on bike runs with other Harley dudes and it became like his way of life. He became obsessed with it. It was like his new obsession, you know, and Jeff kind of has this personality too, you know, like when he picks something up, he kind of obsesses of it, like whether it's playing the guitar or whether it's golf or whether it's fly fishing, like that's his thing right now. He's fucking obsessed with fly fishing. He grew up, he used to be a professional <laughs> fisherman, right? But that's like, 
his obsession. He's like tying flies every day or whatever. And so I feel like I kind of uh, have a similar personality in some ways. And, you know, I'll latch on to something and I'll obsess over it. And, you know, you see this, like people get obsessed with being paleo or obsessed with a ketogenic diet and obsessed with doing CrossFit. And it lasts for like a few months and then maybe it peters out. So I hope that doesn't happen with, with swimming because one of the most remarkable things I've noticed over the last, especially the last two weeks, is I've I've really been working on my form. So that includes my breathing and uh, and really tightening up my form. So, uh, you know, I, I try to swim at least a kilometer. And the goal is I, I try to swim like two kilometers most days. So, but, um, so I'm not swimming like sprints, even though I will do sprints, especially like the last hundred meters. I usually always sprint. And sometimes at like round numbers, like I'll sprint like the 10th lap or like the 20th lap or whatever. Um, and, uh, but I'm really focusing on form and I'm trying to be so intentional. But at the same time, um, I, I wear little earplugs so that water doesn't get in my ears. And what it does is it creates like almost like an insulation in my mind. And it allows me to, it's almost meditative. It, it's because you are just focusing on breathing and it's like you almost count, you know, you can do what's called like a two kick where with every like, uh, when you catch on a freestyle stroke, uh, you, you kick down and it's like a one, two kick rather than like a constant, like flutter kick. So instead of doing that, you, you can do like a, a one, two, a one, two, a one, two, a one, two, and it kind of creates this really like rhythmic meditative thing. And so, you know, like 30, 40 minutes straight of swimming, um, it, it actually creates like, it, it's so peaceful, but at the same time, it isn't just dead mental space. Because I've also found that my mind is able to do like three or four, or it's able to hold like three or four different streams of thought at the same time. So like, I will literally be counting my strokes and I'll be like breathing and I'm like, oh, I'm going to breathe here and I'm correcting my form and I'm like focusing on that. And then at the same time, I'm like analyzing complex political, economic or philosophical texts or problems or something weird like that, you know? And it's such a strange experience because I don't get that when I'm at the gym or when I'm running or when I'm walking. Like, it's not to say that I, I, I don't concentrate on those other things. I do. But I don't have the same level of like multiple streams of thought simultaneously going on. And I found it's like simultaneous. It's not like one crowds out the other. They're both happening at like the same time for 30, 40 minutes at a time. Now, sometimes one is more intense than the other, like when something happens, like, you know, I bump the lane or I come to the wall and I need to make a turn or something like that. And I become more conscious about one thing over the other or, or whatever. But it is so strange that all these things like converge at the, the same time. And it just creates this weird like knot almost of thought. And I think it's really fucking cool. And then when I get out of the pool, I feel, it's hard to explain. I feel alive. And uh, it's so amazing. Like, and then on my walk home, which isn't far, but the pool where I swim, it's this public pool, this outdoor public pool. And the walk home is eh, what, like 10, 15 minutes or whatever. And I can breathe so clearly and I have so much energy, you know, um, it's, it's just a really strange experience and I fucking love it. But it's just that multiple thought thing, that multiple streams of thought that I've, I caught myself the other day doing it. I was like, this is so fucking weird, man. And it's really enjoyable. I don't know. Yeah, that's really cool, dude. Isn't that kind of like a common thing? Like we do our best thinking when we're engaged in a kind of in a minimally complicated task, but still a somewhat complicated task, you know, mentally. So like walking or running or taking a shower or swimming or you know, whatever. Like playing basketball for me. You can just go and just yeah, well, not a not a game, but individually go out and just start shooting. And you're so you're so habituated to the movements that you can just do them barely consciously and then you can like do complicated thinking in the process well and I, I was actually thinking about basketball a lot while i was swimming this was actually like one of the other streams of thought i was like comparing like the intention the intentionality that i'm taking over my form and my breathing and my patterns and everything like that with like how you want to make sure you keep your elbow in and follow through and keep the space underneath, you know, the ball, like in the palm of your hand and rotation. I was actually thinking about how it's really similar to that, like technically, 
how, mm-hmm. you know, just like a minute shift can create a huge difference and you can feel the difference. You see the results immediately. So I was thinking a lot about that. And then I was also thinking that I wonder if because because I'm focusing like so precisely on like form and breath and things like that, that it's almost like that structure allows my brain to be free for other things. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what neurochemically is going on there, but there's something to the degree of like like working your brain out in some minimal task that still has it churning, like prepares it, like warms it up to do the real good work. Yeah, and well, and I think it's because it's so structured, you know? Like, like if I was engaged, but I had like a hundred different projects in front of my desk and I was like blasting caffeine and I got music going and I'm like taking care of my shit, I don't think it would be the same, but it's because like you say, it's this minimally involved because it's quite simple, you know, like the movements are simple. It doesn't mean it's easy. doesn't mean you perfect them, but it's not a thousand different things going on at once. It's like six different things going on at once. And because it's so structured and because it's so precise that it like it's like for some reason that for someone like myself who is such a scatterbrain that structure almost um maybe that's why it's kind of meditative and relaxing as well but it's it's almost like somehow it it creates like a like a propulsion of thought in those other areas so that I can think about like like I was engaging with someone who the vegan antinatalist, I don't know if you saw it or if other people saw it, who was commenting on our um, on our antinatalist episode. And I was thinking a lot about responses and like what he was saying or he or she, I'm sorry, I, actually I'm just assuming, um, he, she, they were saying. And, um, and, uh, and I actually had like, like amazing, like an amazing time of, of thought and philosophical exploration and response and things like that while I was swimming, while I was concentrating on my form, while I was thinking about basketball. It was just, I don't know. It was so interesting. Yeah. It's funny because I think about often that, you know, the hardest thing about doing this podcast is the fact that I have to sit down in front of a microphone the whole time. Like I would Uh. so much rather be pacing around the room um, (laughs) or like walking, hanging out with you or like, yeah, having totally. a beer or something, um, doing something other than just sitting down in front of the computer, right? Because that actually makes it harder for me to think um, clearly mm. about things. Mm. We need to have like, yeah. the, you know how the pop stars have like the mobile microphone they have hooked up to them? We the need Britney to have, Spears mic? Yeah, exactly. We need to have that for the podcast. Yeah, that would actually be I can just walk in the awesome, woods. Dude. And record. Then what I need is I need something that I can have underwater with me so that I can scuba dive <laughs> while i'm swimming and you can play basketball and i'll swim and we record the podcast that's the future of podcasting guys let's make it happen <laughs> yeah but no man i fucking love it i love swimming and i will be posting progress pictures because i'm i shit you not dude i'm leaner now than i have been in a long time like i'm getting in fucking i'm getting ripped dude <laughs> Fuck. like it's actually surprising me like it's weird like it's been a long time since I've been this ripped. Like I'm never in bad shape, but like I'm getting like, fuck, it's crazy. <laughs> so what are you I'll gonna do when you get the, get the tats and can't swim for a month? Oh, I know, man. I'm just gonna have to fucking walk a lot and uh, run and make up for it. So I know. That's going to suck. Uh, but I but I really do. I wonder if it actually will be a good thing for me because I feel like I have a tendency also to burn myself out just on things and people and whatever else because I get that same kind of like obsessiveness over things. And so I think it'll be really good for me to take just a little bit of a break because then I'll be like, oh, man, I miss it. I got to get back to it. And then I'll be itching by like the third week to really get back in the pool. <laughs> but yeah, swimming's amazing or just repetitive activities meditative i'm just gonna keep advocating for swimming fuck everything else just go swimming everybody it's the best the best thing every, ever every sticky leaf from now on is going to be a different variation on swimming <laughs> yeah I, I like swimming in the ocean i like swimming in the pool i actually do think i'm gonna i did decide i think i'm gonna try to train for a triathlon because of this so what what um, are the three things in triathlon again swimming what so else it's a, 
swim, Mountain run, biking? and cycle. And cycle, yeah. Well, usually it's a street, okay. a street, street bike. Oh, a but street, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, but they do like smaller tri uh, triathlons, and I think I'm gonna try one. So they just did one recently. It was like a one kilometer run. Oh no, no, I'm sorry. Was it a a two kilometer run, like a five or ten kilometer bike ride, and then a three hundred meter swim? And I was like, oh, I could do that now. So, um, but I'm gonna try to find something smallish like that. Only thing I'm afraid of is swimming in the ocean because I'm afraid I'm going to get eaten by a shark. But, <laughs> but that's it. Only because I'm in Sydney. If I were anywhere else in the world, I'd probably, or South Africa, I'd be afraid to. But fuck, I'm from Southern California and I grew up in the ocean and I was never afraid of sharks. But for some reason here, it's always in the back of my mind when I'm in the ocean. So, so well, I just got to get Do over Do your tats it. make you stand out more to sharks? Yeah, man, because I'm darker. I look more like a seal. <laughs> and then, of course, if you're wearing like your wetsuit or something like that, then you're going to look more like a seal. But oh, I'll yeah. figure it out. At least I know that a shark doesn't want to kill me, so he'll just bite off my arm and then let me bleed out, and then there's a chance I'll survive. It's not like he's going to eat me whole. So unless it goes for my side, and then just all my guts go spilling out, that's going to suck. But, you know, if it bites my leg or my arm, there's a chance of survival. I'm just going to alter my life course quite a bit yeah, the the vast majority of shark attacks are non-fatal right yeah 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 definitely yeah because they don't like the taste so they get up there and they they get a little snack and then they're like yeah never mind and they kind of yeah, they spit that shit out immediately <laughs> yeah they're like hey, i'm done you're too you're too bony i need a seal and me because i'm all lean and shit from swimming so much that fucking shark's gonna only barely bite into me i'm flexing right now if you can't hear but. yeah you, you've got no meat on you dude that's not gonna be tasty <laughs> all right let's go ahead and wrap up the episode here i'm gonna go to sleep and troy's got to mark essays yeah yeah thanks so much everyone for listening and remember you can find us on the various social medias at owls underscore at underscore dawn you can find us at owls at com. and remember if you give us a five-star uh, rating and review and you ask a short and simple question in the review we'll address it in a couple of minutes on the next episode oh and are we going to launch the poll this week since we have suggestions. Yeah, we have some suggestions. Definitely. Um, uh, we'll probably launch it pretty soon. Should we allow people another good, good. few days when this episode comes out? To, yeah. 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 Okay. So when this episode drops, which will be a Monday, uh, you'll have one more week until the following episode, and then we'll announce the poll. And then uh, we'll start off the new year probably, actually, with the first patron led topic. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Sweet. Well, I think that's pretty much it, unless there's anything else you got to say to all the grandmas out there. Uh, just one more thing, grandmas. What's that? Das Adania Americana.